Okay, so today um, what we want to do is take our ball rig that we've already created in a separate tutorial and we want to set up a blocking animation for a typical bouncing ball. So what we want to do first is just open up Maya and then from there we will get started. So since we have already created our ball rig, um, we just want to reference that into this new scene. So how I want to do that, I want to go into Reference Editor. And then I want to click on this top left button um, on the bottom left of the screen down here. You'll see it says Create Reference. Just select that. And I've already placed my ball rig in the correct project folder, but if you don't see yours right away, you just want to go search for your ball rig that you have already created. Once you have it, just select it and click Reference. Okay, so as you can see in the middle of my screen now, we have my ball rig, which we've created. And if you have that there, you can just close out of your reference editor. So what a reference is going to do is it's really just going to take your older Maya scene, um, your older Maya file that you've already created, whether it's a rig or a model or whatever it might be, and it's going to reference it into a new scene. And the reason that you would do that is you would save space in that Maya scene to just save on render time and that sort of thing. If you create everything in one scene, it can get a little a little bulky, a little kludgy. So if you split things up and then you reference them in, you can keep, keep it a little bit cleaner. So that's why we wanted to do that. Okay, so we have um, our ball rig in our new Maya scene here. And I just want to do a file, save scene as, because we're going to do our bouncing ball animation. So I'm just going to call this bouncing ball 01. And just click save as, and it should put it in your scenes folder in your project window. Okay, so that looks good. We now have our new scene created. Um, like I've done on some of the other ones, I just want to turn my wireframe on shaded onto my ball. So I'm going to go up to the top and I'm just going to select that. Okay, and then from there, we want to get started to set up this animation. So the first thing that we want to do with our bouncing ball animation is create a floor because we obviously need a ball to be able to bounce and in order for that to happen, it has to have a floor to kind of make um, some type of contact with. So I'm just going to click spacebar. I'm going to go to create, polygon primitives, and over to cube. Um, you can't see it because it actually created it inside my ball. So I'm just going to click R and I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. Okay. Um, so you can just leave it like that for now. We will go in and adjust it in just a second to get it sized right and uh, correctly placed throughout our scene. But what else we want to do um, in some of our other projects, what we've done is we've set up a render cam and that's what we've used to actually render out our animations at the end with our play blast. For this, we're just going to use the side view as our render cam in a way, um, rather than creating a render cam and just mirroring it to the side view. Okay, so what I want to do first is I want to go up to playback. Make sure that you're on the uh, animation tab here. Go up to playback and then go down to display render settings. This will load up your render settings um, tab here. I'm going to scroll down a little bit and I just want to set this at HD 720. That's what I typically use, um, especially for these tutorials. So I'm just going to select HD 720 and I'm just going to click close. So that should be good. Now when we, um, we load up some of our other render settings, it will all be out throughout that uh, HD 720, which is what we're looking for. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is load up our side view so that we can start to actually see what our scene will uh, end up looking like and then we can set up our floor from there. So I'm just going to click spacebar and it's going to load my four panels. The bottom right, that is my side X view. I'm just going to select that. So I'm going to go down to it and just click spacebar inside. And you'll see that we just have that rectangle that we created with our ball. Um, so from here, I want to go up to view, down to camera settings, and I want to turn on my resolution gate. So my resolution gate, as you can see up on top here, um, it's, it's currently set at 1280 by 720. That's what we had just adjusted in our render settings. And that's what we want to um, animate on. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. 
and just kind of line up our floor um, to get things kind of laid out more correctly. I'm going to make our floor a little bit wider than what we have and a little bit thinner. Um, it doesn't really matter how thin your floor is, just kind of a personal preference type thing. And then I'm just going to kind of drop it underneath our ball. I'm also going to turn on that wireframe on shaded um, in my side view as well. So I think that my floor where it is right now is a good, is a good width. Um, and it kind of matches up decently with my ball. So I kind of like how that looks. What I want to do is I just want to select my, uh, my cube that I created to be my floor. And I'm just going to rename it floor. Okay. Um, so now I just want to adjust my camera a tiny bit just to make sure that everything is exactly where I want it. So I'm going to kind of roughly center this on the bottom here. And when I have my side view set up how I think I like it, I'm gonna go up to the left here, and one of the new settings in Maya is just this new lock camera setting. Um, it's available in Maya 2017, so if you're using Maya 2016 or anything um, that's dated back a little bit further, you will have to actually select your camera and select all of your attributes and then click lock selected. But with the new settings in Maya 2017, I can just go up to the top left here and click this new lock camera button and now I cannot adjust my camera even if I try to now. So that is exactly what we want. We don't want to move our camera and tweak it as we start our animation. I just want to leave it in place. Okay, so in the past we've been animating with two panes on top and then one on the bottom. I'm going to change that up a little bit for my bouncing ball because I'm going to do all my animation in this side view. So what I'm actually going to do is go up to panels and do layouts and I just want to do two panes stacked this time. Okay. So my bottom pane like we've set before I'm gonna go into panels, panel and I'm gonna mark it as the graph editor. I'm gonna shrink that down just a little bit and as you can see on my top view now um, which is my side view or my or my render cam that we're gonna be using I can't see my entire resolution gate. So I can't actually see everything that's going to be rendered out if we were to create a play blast from this. So in order to fix that, I can go over to view and I can go down to camera settings. And then over on the right here, the very bottom is overscan. I'm just going to select that. Okay. And as you can see, the overscan actually adjusted um, our layout a little bit. So I'm going to unlock my camera just by clicking that lock camera button again. I'm going to zoom this in kind of how I had it before. Get that how I want it. And then I'm going to relock my camera um, just by clicking that green button again up on the top left. So now my camera is locked back in and we should be good to go. I want to make my graph editor just a little bit bigger. And as you can see now, no matter how big I make that graph editor, we're always going to have that full resolution gate um, kind of in our panel up on top in that screen so that we can see exactly what we'll be rendering. So if we were to do a final render on our bouncing ball after we were done, anything that's gray like you see on the sides and on the top and the bottom, that would not render out. All that we would see is this blue that's in the, uh, in the middle of the screen. So I'm also going to turn my grid off at this point. Um, that's a personal preference thing of mine. Um, but to turn your grid off in any of your panels is right up here on the top. Um, it's just a little grid looking button. You can just select it and it'll wipe out your grid. Okay, so if we have everything here how we want it, the next thing that we need to do is actually start doing our animation and blocking out this bouncing ball. So for the first thing that I want to do is go into my animation settings which is down on the bottom right hand side of the screen. It's the little guy that's running. Um, I'm just going to select that and it will load up our preferences. Under settings I want to select animation and in the animation tab I just want to make sure that my tangents here are plateau and stepped. I'm also going to turn on weighted tangents. Um, you don't have to but it's just an option for you. So if I have plateau and stepped in here, I'm going to click save. One more thing that I want to use for my bouncing ball that we didn't necessarily use in some of the previous tutorials 
is my auto key. And that is this button that's right next to our animation preferences. So I'm gonna go down to the auto key and I'm gonna select it so that it's, it's lit up blue like it is on my screen right here. Once I have it lit up blue, that means that whenever we make a change in our animation, Maya will automatically key that for us. It will key the difference. It's just a little bit easier for me. I like working on the auto key. You don't have to do that. I would recommend trying both ways out with it on and with it off to see what works best for you. Okay, so if I have everything set up how I want it, it's, uh, it's time for us to start actually blocking this thing out. So I'm going to save one more time just to save the progress that we've already made. And I'm going to select my bouncing ball. I'm going to make sure that I'm on frame number one. And I'm just going to pull that ball up into the top left-hand side of my uh, viewport. And just kind of drop it in wherever. Once I have it up there, I do need to actually key our first frame. So I'm going to select S on my keyboard. And you can see the keyframe that was just created. Um, in one year graph editor, you can see the little orange dot and also on your time slider on the bottom uh, In the number one key, you can see that red line. That's your keyframe So from here we want to key out the rest of our bouncing ball And we just want to do some basic block steps so that everything works together All right, so I'm actually not even going to use my graph editor for right now. Um, so I'm going to select up into my side view and I'm going to click spacebar and now what we'll see is it'll just enlarge it for us a little bit I'm going to select my master move one more time and you can see that keyframe that's still there and what you want to do is go through and just mark your extreme poses based off of your reference footage that you've already created so I've created my reference footage on the side um, and I've kind of made notes through my thumbnail sketches on where my keys should be so my first key is obviously frame number one. And in my reference footage, my ball hits the ground for the first time on frame number 20. So what I want to do is just roughly bring that ball down a little bit angled off to the side. So it looks like it's touching that floor. And I'm just going to drop it into place. And you can see once I move it and, and adjust it, a keyframe will automatically set for me here on frame 20. So in my reference footage, the next thing that happens um, is around frame 33. So on frame 33, my bouncing ball reaches the top of its arc for its second bounce. So I'm going to go about halfway up between my first bounce and my second bounce. That's normally about the weight that the, uh, that the ball will lose after its first bounce, all depending on what kind of ball you have. But in my arc and in my reference footage, my bouncing ball comes about halfway up from where I originally dropped it. So that's about where I'm going to set it in my blocking here on frame 33. And you'll see that that keyframe automatically sets itself here. I'm then going to move up to frame 43 and go back down off to the side and just drop that into place. Next for me is frame 53. So as you can see, I'm just moving myself down here in the time slider to my new frame. It highlights it, and then I'm moving my ball. I'm going to go about halfway up again from uh, where my second bounce was this time. And then I, I hit the ground again on frame 63. So I'm going to drop this back down on frame 63. And then I reach back up at frame 73, and I'm getting much smaller now with my bounces. I'm barely going up um, at all because it's really lost its velocity at this point. I then hit the ground at frame 81 and you can see that these are going to start shortening themselves up quite a bit because our ball is, is slowing down at this point. At frame 87 I then reach the top of my next arc which is going to be very small. And then frame 92 we come back down and then frame 97 we go back up just a tiny bit for this one I barely want it to come off of the ground this is that last bounce until we kind of settle into our our final spot frame 102 I'm gonna hit the ground for the last time 
And then I'm going to go up to frame 116. And that's actually where my ball is going to settle. So I'm just going to drag it over. I'm a little bit close to the end of my floor. And you'll see it kind of settle in when we block through our animation. And when we start to mess with the timing, we'll work with that as well and put a nice ease into that final spot. So if I click spacebar after I have all of those first movements blocked out, in my graph editor, you'll see that it looks kind of like a staircase. That's exactly what we're looking for. That means that you've now blocked your animation. And your bouncing ball is not going to move until you hit that next keyframe. So as you can see, if I just run my time slider between frames 1 and 19 here, it doesn't look like anything's happening. That's because Maya hasn't calculated those in-betweens yet. But if I go to frame 20, I'll jump down to the bottom. And that can kind of work its way up throughout the rest of the, um, the blocking that we set up. So let's just um, let's take a look at this and see what it looks like. It's going to be very basic at this point. It's going to be tough to get a good read, but you should be able to get a feel for the general timing at this point, just based off of what we've set so far. So that looks pretty good. Um, it's a good start for what we're looking for. You can see the adjusted um, weight that we're getting and how the velocity really dies out towards the end. It looks like my bounces are all set up pretty well. Um, they all go about halfway up from the one in front of it. Um, and it really dies out at the end for me there. Um, it kind of ease, rolls into that final spot. So that's really what I'm looking for for my first set of blocking. And then from here, we want to take this and advance it forward just a little bit to kind of add in some detail before we fully spline this thing out. So when I have this set up exactly how I want it, I'm just going to save one more time and make a habit of that so that I don't lose any progress that we've had so far. So now we want to add in some in-betweens so that we can get a better feel for what this timing is going to look like. And with those in-betweens, we can then start to add in a little bit of our squash and our stretch because we can block that movement in and it'll just save us time in the end. And it'll help us really visualize exactly what our timing is going to be before we start to do a full spline on our animation. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I want to actually be able to see what my motion trail is for my ball. So I, I know that it's up here on frame one. And on your keyboard, if you click the uh, the period button or the comma button, you'll actually jump ahead or back to the, uh, to the next keyframe. So if I just click the period button, I can see that I'm kind of falling down and then I go back up. And if I just kind of run through that, my arcs look pretty good. Um, but I just roughly block these out and I don't trust them fully right now. So how can I actually see them and, and see what my arcs are without like legitimately drawing on my screen. Well, there's an easy way to do that. And what you want to do is just select your master move because you want to select the item that you're, that you're animating. And then up on the top here, you should have a bunch of different layers. Um, it says curves, surfaces, polygons, and so forth. I'm selected on the animation tab. And underneath it, there's a bunch of different options. What I want to do is that second one that comes in off of the left. If I just highlight it on the bottom, you can see it says motion trail, um, select objects to generate a motion trail over time. I'm going to select that. And you'll see that Maya automatically calculates the motion trail for what our bouncing ball is doing right now. And this will give us a nice um, visualization of what our arcs look like and of what our bounces look like. So I can already see a couple adjustments that we're going to need to go in and make because obviously we just roughly blocked this thing out and we really didn't know exactly where our arcs were supposed to be. But the first one that sticks out to me is frame 33. Frame 33, for me, I want it to be almost dead center between frame 20 and frame 43 because this spot here is where that ball is kind of heading back up and it, it should be centered. So I, I'm going to move this over a little bit so that it's a little more centered than where it was right now, um, just so that that arc looks a little bit better. 
I'm then going to go over to frame 53 and let's see what that kind of looks like. And that one actually looks looks pretty good. Um, and the one nice thing about the motion trail is that you can actually edit right on it. So I don't even have to select my master move to, to adjust it. If I want to adjust where frame 53 is, I can just select it and I can pull it wherever I want. And then if I pull my animation over, it will change um, the animation as far as the bouncing ball goes. So that's, that's a nice thing about it and it, it really lets you see exactly what's going on. So I'm gonna drop this down just a tiny bit so it's a little more um, kind of halfway lined up with frame 33. And I'm gonna move it just a tiny bit but that one was actually pretty close. Frame 73 for me, I do want to adjust. Um, I'm gonna pull that over just a little bit. Okay, frame 87, it's a little too far right. It seems like that's kind of um, what we have for most of them. And then frame 97 was a little too far to the right for me as well. So that looks a little bit better. You probably won't be able to see too much of a change if you just watch through your blocking because we still haven't added in the rest of the detail. But it will make a noticeable difference when you do start your splines and when you really start to define those arcs. So what I want to do next is start to add in uh, um, just some of those in between so that we can get an idea of where they might be. So I'm going to go to frame 13 and I'm going to pull my ball down quite a bit. Um, just a little over halfway, almost lined up a little bit underneath where frame 33 is and a little bit off to the right. And the reason that I'm pulling it off to the right is because in the end, I want my ball to really follow a path that's a little smoother than just obviously these kind of jagged lines up and down. Um, and that's what we're gonna start to block in. So frame 13 um, is now off to the right a little bit. So the ball is gonna almost be pushed out to start this movement that we're gonna be having. I'm also gonna go to frame five and I'm gonna drop just a little bit and slowly build in that first arc. I'm gonna keep frame five somewhat close to the top and that's actually just blocking in an ease out. So I want frame one to frame five to go somewhat slow. And then I want the ball to just really fall from there. And that's when we'll start to feel the velocity that the ball is going to have. I'm going to lower frame 13 just a tiny bit. And then I'm going to jump in between my next, my next big change, which is frame 20 and 33. So I'm going to jump up to just say uh, frame 27. And I want to pull this up. Um, and go a little bit to the left to kind of build in that arc that's going to be right here. And I'm going to go a little bit under where I had frame 13, a little over where the halfway mark would be between frame 20 and 33. I'm then going to jump ahead to frame 38. And I'm going to line this up on the other side. I'm going to go a little bit underneath where frame 27 was um, and off to the right. And then the next would obviously be that 43. So we want to jump in between frame 43 and 53 at this point. So I'm just going to go up to frame 48. And I'm going to move my ball up here. And I'm going to go just a little bit above half again off to the left. Coming back down, I'm just going to jump to say frame 58. And I'm going to almost line that up with what we had on frame 48 as far as that arc goes. And then I'm going to move forward to frame 67. And all of these um, keyframes that I'm using, they may be different for your animation. You just want to block it out so that they work for you. Um, everyone has possibly used a different type of ball. Every different ball that you use is gonna have a different arc. It's going to have a different weight to it. So make sure that you're blocking this out to match your reference footage. Okay, so I'm just going to go through and I'm going to add the rest of these in here. So I'm on frame 83, and then I'm going to jump up to frame 89 and grab this in between here. Pull that down a little bit, frame 83. Okay, and then we have frame 92, 97, 102, and 116. Since those are pretty close, I'm just going to actually leave those ones alone. 
Uh, I'm not going to add anything else in there. We don't want to add too many keyframes in um, because then it's just going to be a, a mess when we start splining it. But we do want to adjust it a little bit and add some of those in between so that we can really start to feel um, the weight of the ball. So now if we were to watch it, let's see what it looks like with some of these in-betweens. So it's looking a little bit better. Um, it's obviously a little bit easier now to see what that movement is, is and to see the arcs that this ball is going to be following throughout our animation and to really feel the weight that we have. Um, I notice a couple tweaks that I'd like to make to mine at the beginning, especially. Um, as you can see, the ball almost feels like it's floating between frames 5 and 13 for me. So I'm going to actually just drop frame 13 down a little bit more um, from where it was. And I might move frame 5 out to say frame seven. So how to do that, um, oh, let me move 13 again. In my time slider, I'm just gonna shift and then left click on frame five. You'll see that it highlights red. I'm just going to middle mouse click and pull it over a couple of frames so that it's now frame seven. And you'll see that it actually updates itself in our viewport as well. So let's see what that little tweak did. So that actually may be a little too fast. Um, the ball is going pretty quick. So just a, one more quick change. I'm going to pull 13 up just a little bit more, almost to where I had it before. Maybe just moving that frame 5 to frame 7 was enough. So that looks a little bit better. Um, I'm not going to get too picky with it right now because we are just blocking this out. Um, but from here, what you want to do is start to really mess with your timing. You really want to get it so that your ball feels like it's bouncing and not floating from one key to the other. Obviously, it's a little difficult to read because it is blocked and because there is no in-betweens. But you should be able to get a good sense of timing just from doing your blocking. So when I get all of these keyframes lined up kind of how I want them, I feel pretty comfortable with where they are. The next thing that I want to do is block in the squash and a little bit of rotate as well. When we set up our bouncing ball rig, we hid um, a bunch of the attributes so that we only can see our translates, our rotate X, and our squash. Those are the only um, features that we're going to be able to animate on this ball. So we want to block things out for all of them, for everything that's possible. Um, so I'm going to go up right now. We've really only blocked out translate Y and Z. Translate X I'm actually not going to use for this animation, um, but we do want to want to block in Rotate X and Squash. So if I were to go up and I select my Master Move, let's start putting in our Squash. Um, so right now on frame 1, our ball will be full. Our ball has not started to move at all. We don't want to have any type of Squash or Stretch at this point. But when I go to frame 7, it starts to slowly dip down. So I'm gonna add in just a very, very small um, stretch to come into play here. I'm gonna go up to around, say, 0.9 or so. All of that will obviously adjust on how you guys set up your bouncing ball and how you set up your squash rig. Um, but that looks good for me, and I'm also going to click E and adjust my rotate a little bit. So you'll see that I'm adjusting my rotate X just to give it a little bit of a dip. So now, if we were to look at it, you can kind of see the this um, that blue arc in the middle of that blue line. That's our rotate X. Almost think of it as like an arrow and that's gonna be guiding us throughout our animation. So right here, it's straight up and down and it starts to kind of turn. Um, and we, we get a very small stretch. So then if we were to jump ahead to frame 13, obviously at this point, this is almost as fast as our ball is going to move throughout our entire animation. So that should be as stretched as it's possibly going to be. I'm going to pull the stretch up a little bit more, up to maybe 3. And I'm going to click E, and I'm going to adjust my rotate 
so that my, my blue line is a little more in line with my arc that I have created here. And so that we're pointing down and really looking at that um, number 20, which is on the bottom. That's where we want to end up dropping to. So we want our ball to line up facing it. So now if we were to look at it, our first couple of frames, just by clicking on the period in the, in the comma, we can kind of jump through and just see what it looks like. So that looks pretty good. And we want to go down to frame 20. On frame 20, this is where we will get squashed. So I'm going to drop that to say frame, uh, maybe about three and a half or so. That might even be a little too much, but it'll work for right now. And then I'm going to click E. And here, I'm actually just going to set my rotate X to zero. So up, you know, you can just adjust it if you want. Um, on the handle, I'm just going to go up to the top right over in the uh, channel box and just type in a zero on rotate X. I want it to be straight up and down at this point. I'm then going to click W and I'm going to pull my ball down. The ball throughout this entire next step is going to start to come off of the floor because when we start adding in that squash and stretch, it's just going to change kind of the dimensions of it. So you might just have to adjust your, uh, your translate Y value. When you hit your when you hit your bottoms for some of those so if we look at this now you can see our ball kind of eases out of the beginning slowly starts to really get stretched out and then when it hits the bottom it gets squashed that's what we're looking for now what we're going to want to do is run through the rest of our animation and add in the squash and stretch and our rotate as we go. So I'm just going to click the period button and it's going to jump me ahead to my next keyframe. First thing I normally set is my squash value. So if I if I select it over in the channel box and then I just middle mouse click in my screen, you can see it comes up with the left and the right arrow. Then I can just pull it left and right and it's an easy way to kind of adjust your squash and your stretch. I'm going to set it to around two for this time. I think two looks about good. And then I'm going to click E and I'm going to change my rotate so that it's lining itself back up um, with our arc. So that looks pretty good. Okay, so I want to go ahead to frame 33. And I'm going to click my rotate X and I'm going to put a zero in there again because we want our ball to be straight up and down. And I'm going to add a stretch or a squash. Sorry. At this point, what you want to notice is obviously your squash will probably not be as big of a value because we're not actually hitting the floor. And as we work our way through the rest of the animation, the squash and the stretch values are going to start to get smaller and smaller because the ball just doesn't have that same velocity that it had at the beginning when we dropped it on keyframe number one. So as we kind of move towards the end, towards our frame 116, where it really settles into its final position, the ball's going to slowly start to take its, its normal shape. And around, probably for me, frame 81 or so, we're barely going to see any type of squash and stretch in it. You guys are more than welcome to adjust that. Um, the more squash and stretch you have, the more cartoony it'll look. So, you know, there's no right or wrong as long as that goes, as long as you're consistent throughout your animation. So just continue to work forward at this point and work in those squash and stretch values and your rotate. And let's just block the rest of this out real quick so that we can get an idea of what this will look like. So here I need to move it back down a little bit because we had a little bit of a squash value. And we will continue to move on. Okay, so on the top we're going to have it squashed and we're going to start to really kind of lessen how much squash and stretch we're having. Back to a little bit of a squash, maybe like 0.8 ish. And we want to rotate 63. We should be hitting the ground again. So we'll put it around 
put our rotate x value at zero and pull the ball down a tiny bit and just continue to work that through. So as I get close to that frame number 80, that was kind of my magic number to where I barely wanted to see any squash and stretch coming into play. Um, I put about 0.2 on it here at frame 76. When I hit the bottom here at frame 81, I'm going to go about negative 0.2 and kind of keep it con somewhat consistent. When you actually animate it out, you will see a little bit of a change, but you just want it to be subtle because you want to remember that at this point the ball is moving fairly slow and is barely leaving the ground. So I'm going to go to point one on this one. I'm just going to type it in. And here. And now I'm going to completely get rid of that squash and stretch. I'm just going to zero this out. And I'm just going to adjust my rotate from here on out. Um, so frame 116, I'm going to rotate it um, quite a bit, almost a full 360 degrees. You might not see it too much, um, but when your ball has gone through this entire movement, when it does hit the end, it's going to roll. Um, it's going to come to a slow stop after that roll. So I'm just going to kind of roughly block that roll in. We may not see it since we don't have a texture on our ball, um, but we'll have to mess with that later to make sure that it looks right. So at this point, I have gone through and I've added in some squash and stretch um, to all of my different keyframes in here. And I just want to take a look and, and see how we did. So I'm going to go back to frame number one and just click play. Okay, so... My squash and stretch for the most part actually looks pretty good. I may bump it up a tiny bit at the end so that there's a little movement um, because I'm not seeing much of it at all and I know I didn't put a ton of it in there so I may just increase those values just a little bit so there's a little more movement there. Um, as far as the timing goes for this, for me right now, I would probably speed things up a little bit at the beginning. It feels a little a little flat, um, like, like my ball is floating a little bit here. Um, dropping down to frame 13. It just doesn't have that movement that I'm looking for. Um, so let me just kind of slowly adjust it. I'm going to pull this up a little bit. And then I'm going to pull this one down a little bit. And let's see what that does. So I think that helped um, get it going a little bit more at the beginning. It gives it more speed. You know, we want, when it falls down, we really want to exaggerate the drop. Um, and we're doing that on frame 13 and frame 38. And then I want it to really take its time coming back up and, and slow back down when it hits the top of my arc. So right here on frame 27, I may even pull that up a little bit more. And then I might pull down frame 38 a tiny bit more as well. Um, you still want to make sure your arcs are okay. So watch them. Frame 13, I may pull down a tiny bit more. Um, and then I can kind of work that through throughout the rest of these keyframes as well. And remember, this is just your blocking. Things are going to change a ton when you do start to spline this out. But it's nice to have it somewhat close at the beginning.
So it's starting to look a little bit better. Obviously, the uh, the timing is not perfect. Um, if we base it off of a reference footage, you know, that's not something that's animated. So I want to give this bouncing ball some character. And the way to do that is to mess with timing and kind of exaggerate things. I would go in now and add in some ease and some out. Really exaggerate that timing on some of these keyframes so that it, when my ball when my ball falls, it really falls with some force. And then it comes back up and almost sits on the top before it jumps back down again. Um, and that's kind of how I would go ahead and work this. I'd also be very careful at the end so that I get this um, ease into frame number 116 correct and that the ball really rolls into a nice slow stop. I don't want that to look automated in any way. Um, timing is extremely important and your spacing is extremely important when it comes to your bouncing ball because if you don't have your timing right, it's gonna look like it's floating and it's gonna look like it's just kind of out in Mars with no gravity. So you just need to really tweak it, show it to other people, let them look at it so that you can make sure that your timing starts to look right um, because you want to feel the weight of that bouncing ball and that can be hard to get when you're working on a computer. Okay, so what I would want to do at this point, um, I'm happy with how my blocking looks and I want to just create a play blast so that I can take a look at this uh, file as a movie instead of kind of picking through it in Maya. So I'm going to load up my, pers my side view, which is my render cam in this instance here. And then I'm going to go to show and I'm going to scroll all the way down close to the bottom where it says motion trails. I'm just going to turn that off for right now because I don't want to see the motion trail on my play blast. It's just going to add in more objects. And I'm really just more worried about looking at my ball movement here. So we can look at how the blocking itself works and let's render out a play blast. So I'm just gonna stop that. I'm gonna make sure my, my time slider is set up for the frames I want, which is one to 120, which is that five seconds that we're looking for. I'm gonna right click and go to the play blast option box. I wanna make sure my quality is pulled up to 100% and that my scale is pulled up to one. Um, I'm just gonna rename this blocking 01. It should be putting it in that correct project folder in our movies tab, which is what it's doing. So I'm just gonna click play blast. All right, and that should load up our QuickTime video. And now we can take a look at what our animation is so far. So that's kind of a basic process on how we would block out our bouncing ball animation. From here, we would go in, really mess with the timing, get it exactly how we want it, add in any other in-betweens that we want to work with, maybe any other ease-ins and, um, and ease-outs that we want. And then we would start to slowly spline this out, which you guys can watch um, in another tutorial. So hopefully you learned a little bit on how to set up a blocking as far as your bouncing ball goes. Obviously yours will look a little bit different than mine based off of what type of ball you use in your reference footage, but the same process and the same flow um, kind of work for both. So if you have everything set up for how you are right now, render out that play blast. And then in the next tutorial, we will look at how to spline this out and really smooth this into a nice animation.